Hello students. Welcome back. Now let us move ahead with the third paper in this semester, the one on post-colonial literatures. Well, I think to begin with, we need to ponder over the word post-colonial or the phrase post-colonial when it is used to describe literature, when it is used as an adjective to describe literature. So what kind of literature are we talking about when we deal with post-colonial literature, when we deal with the term post-colonial literature or literatures? Well, it goes without saying that the study of English literature today would be totally incomplete without uh, taking stock of the post-colonial literatures, that is, English literature produced in the post-colonial times strictly in a chronological sense we refer to literatures that have been written or produced after the period of imperialism or after the colonies gained their independence but that's only a very broad way of looking at post-colonial literatures it's, I think, a very general uh, way of looking at post-colonial literatures and that kind of uh, definition or that kind of um, meaning does not do justice to the uh, richness, the depth and the dynamism and the politics of post-colonial literatures. Well, to begin with, we know that the term post-colonial is used to describe literature that comes from and belongs to a place and a period that is affected by colonization. We assume that it is written by a person who's, um, who uses a language that was given to him or her by colonization. Now, these are again some of the broad assumptions that we make regarding post-colonial literature. Uh, post-colonial literatures also um, show a very keen sense of awareness of what it means to uh, write from a position, a place, and write in a language that is affected by colonization. Therefore, postcolonial literatures is something that refers not simply to writing which came after empire, you know, to use that sense of post. It is much more than that. Postcolonial literatures, therefore, can be understood as that which critically and in a sometimes subversive manner analyzes and scrutinizes the relationship of the native with the colonizer so it it uh, analyzes the the colonial relationship in a very critical manner it is the kind of writing that in various ways resists colonial um, perspectives colonial stands colonial ideologies colonial um, ways of life. So um, we uh, we I think need to understand the um, post-colonial literature as that which um, forms or that which is part of the 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 the, the overhaul. You know that um, of decolonization, the overhaul that was brought in as part of 
the process of decolonization it is a kind of reshaping of um dominant meanings and post colonial writers therefore may be seen as those who um subvert and resist the myths of power the classification of races and generally the images of subordination that were left by the period of colonization so post colonial writing uh, is something that is very strongly marked by uh, you know the topic of uh, cultural exclusion and uh, subordination and so on one can see post colonial literature as something that emerges to begin with on a very strong nationalist note so they seek to define themselves post colonial writers you know to begin with they begin to uh, they seek to uh, locate themselves to define themselves um and to uh, free themselves from the colonial meanings in which they were um, imprisoned till then so it would be a helpful point i think to understand the term post colonial as it is written on this slide as different from post colonial with a hyphen you know that probably refers to a merely chronological point uh, you know uh, meaning literature that comes after the period of colonization but when it's written like this post colonial with no hyphen and sometimes written you know as a single word we tend to understand it as something that is much more than chronological it refers to something deeper than merely the time factor and that is what we will be discussing during the course of this paper to begin with i will deal with a poet now whom you are already familiar with in one of the papers that we did during the first semester the poet is of course ak ramanujan we've already discussed his work um, obituary in the context of indian writing in english i think we can consider ak ramanujan as one of the major post colonial english indian english poets because he belongs to uh, you know again to look at it chronologically when you look at the time period you we we can um, definitely see a division between um, you know poets like ak ramanujan and um, you know dom uh, ray and kamla das on the one side and earlier poets like uh, rabindranath tagore or sarojini naidu or thoru dat and you know all those writers they clearly belong to the pre um, independence period so they may be considered as part of the colonial period of indian writing in english and people like ak ramanujan definitely belong to the um, post colonial period you know the time is definitely after the period of uh, colonization that is when he migrated uh, abroad and settled down in the united states and where he continued his um, immense work of uh, translation as a professor of linguistics you know he introduced to the west some of the unknown gems of indian literature uh, the west had already um, got familiar with indian literature mainly through the work done by the uh, the orientalist scholars but as is, is common knowledge by now the orientalists mainly um, concerned themselves only with uh, elite works you know sanskrit largely sanskrit works so the west had this idea about india that uh, ancient indian literature is sanskrit literature 
but it was you know the work done by ekera manujan which i highlighted the fact that india has its own uh, folk tradition too you know you have the folk narratives you have um, in various languages so the that um, um, multiplicity of indian literature was um, unveiled to the western world uh, to a large extent by the work done by ekera manujan well it's not that part of ekera manujan that we need to discuss in this paper here we are looking at him as a poet and uh, we need to look at the um, poet and his work as post colonial how does he become a post colonial poet not just in the chronological sense but in what ways does he counter the colonial strategies in what way does he rewrite or un uh, un uh, undo the colonial um, um colonial uh, let us say you know, the colonial edicts in you know so how how does he counter how does he resist and how does he um uh, emerge as a as a, an independent voice as a unique voice and what is it that makes him post colonial in that sense how how has he um, remained free of colonial influence and um, coined his own uh, poetic idiom and to understand that we have a poem prescribed for our study it's a small poem called self portrait so this is the poem self portrait it's just um, you know a nine lined uh, poem made up of just one long sentence i resemble everyone but myself and sometimes see in shop windows despite the well known laws of optics the portrait of a stranger date unknown often signed in a corner by my father so this is the simple poem i think we can begin with the title itself you know self portrait i think there's something uh, unique about that term uh, you know the moment we use the term uh, self portrait we are reminded of some of the classics of western painting isn't that so you i'm sure have seen the self portraits of poets like the dutch uh, renaissance painters you know the dutch masters like rembrandt and um, many of them many of the european painters you know it's it's something whereas when you think of indian painters like uh, whether it is tagore or um, uh, raja ravi varma or uh, anjali lamenon or any any one of the indian poets man or woman um, uh, colonial or post colonial uh, self portrait is definitely not um, uh, you know a, a very common medium of expression we do not find many self portraits uh, tagore has uh, umpteen paintings raja ravi varma has umpteen paintings all the you know mf hussein they, they all have umpteen paintings of their own but not many of them have specialized in uh, self portraits there are of course one or two uh, self portraits but they definitely do not define the work of those writers unlike you know rembrandt you know the moment you think of rembrandt you are, you think of his self portraits van gogh again very um, well known for his self portrait so it's a it's a largely western phenomenon you know it's not just self portraits in paintings but even with regard to autobiographies you know think of the large number of autobiographies written by the western writers and compare them with the uh, you know far less number of autobiographies written by indians of course now the uh situation has changed and many indians are of course taking to uh, the writing of their selves um, writing autobiographies and getting their biographies written too but uh, for a very long period of time um, the autobiography was a largely western phenomenon i am reminded of um, mahatma gandhi's autobiography you know he he does not even call it an autobiography he calls it uh, my experiments with truth in the preface to which he talks about the uh, uneasy beginning that he made when he decided to write 
uh, this kind of a work. Uh, many were the people who expressed surprise, and uh, you know, he himself was not very comfortable with the idea of uh, writing about oneself. And there he highlights the fact that the autobiography is a largely Western phenomenon. We do not indulge in that kind of self analysis. You know, we do not do that kind of self analysis because our understanding of the self is largely and traditionally very different from the Western understanding of the self. The Western understanding, especially uh, after the period of um, uh, let us say the renaissance and the enlightenment period uh, it is one that focuses on the individual you know when we discussed american literature when we discussed the work of a writer like emerson for example we talked at length about the very um, powerful uh, impetus that the concept of the self gains in western and particularly american context you know the the individual is celebrated the hero the central character the protagonist is somebody who is um, you know always um, center stage and uh, you know whose life is um, uh, you know one that um, um, lords over one that towers over that of others you know whether you look at the uh, the western epics or the western classics of any literary genre you find that you know the protagonist or the hero is somebody who has a very powerful role whereas uh, you know when you look at indian uh, context um, um, you know even when you look at um, an epic like the mahabharat um, you know it's not very e easy to define who the central character there is is it arjuna or is it uh, sri krishna in other words we often tend to think of the individual as less important than the universal self isn't that so we have this concept of um, advaita that we are all part of that uh, universal cosmic being we are all uh, the jivatmas which are part of the immense paramatma and it is when the jivatma attains union with the paramatma that we attain salvation so this has traditionally been the con indian concept of the self and this poem is one that we would uh, be able to appreciate better when we place ourselves at that point where we can distinguish between this uh, traditional and general western way of individualism and the eastern or specifically the indian concept of the atma and paramatma which is why the poem says that you know it it's a, a self portrait is largely expected to look like the person rembrandt self portraits look like him van gogh self portraits look like him whereas here he says i resemble everyone but myself there's nothing distinctive about him he he seems to resemble everyone he looks like everyone else i resemble everyone but myself in other words there's nothing that is very unique or distinctive about him he has been brought up in a tradition where he has been taught that he is just like the others and that there is no way that he can consider himself as being superior or uh, uh, to the others as uh, being uh, cut above the others i resemble everyone but myself and sometimes see in shop windows and that is why you know the reflection that he has is that of himself in shop windows when he looks at the reflection of his face in as seen in um glass panes shop windows and so on you know it you do not even have a proper painting here so when i look at my own reflection despite the well known laws of optics you know he is sure that there is nothing wrong with his eyesight the laws of optics state that his eyesight is perfect but what he sees uh, staring back at him would often be the portrait of a strange in other words it is with much difficulty that he tries to locate anything unique or individual in himself you know from his birth he has been um, 
trained into in, in in this mode of thinking whereby he begins to believe that he is you know just part of a larger entity that there is nothing that sets him apart from others so i look at myself and i see the portrait of a stranger and there is nothing specific about it the date is unknown you know a self portrait whether drawn by um, the artist himself or a portrait drawn by someone else would always have as its distinctive feature the date the date on which the portrait was made but here there is no date you know in other words from time immemorial times immemorial this has been the situation uh, you know in the past as in the present uh, it the the situation is pretty much the same i look like everyone else and that is why the date is immaterial here this is a self portrait that is very different in a conventional self portrait the date is specified it is a very important aspect of the self portrait but here such things do not matter the date does not matter the date is unknown and often signed in a corner by my father you know it comes as a you know if one line beneath the rest of the poem to give it that kind of prominence uh, indicating how you know uh, in in a conventional port self portrait uh, the painter uh, you know would have painted would have inscribed his or her name very clearly in the portrait so it it would be scribbled somewhere uh, whether it is the artist himself or someone else who does it the artist's signature is very clearly seen in these portraits but here uh, it is a, it is supposed to be a self portrait but he realizes that he himself does not have much of a say in the creation of this self portrait on the other hand it is rather the signature of his father that he seems to decipher or see in that portrait in other words he is absolutely certain about the fact that he is what he is not because of anything unique in himself but because of the way he has been brought up but because of the family that he belongs to because of the tradition that he belongs to you know this um, we have already discussed this point when we discussed ekira manojan's poetry in indian writing in english we uh, found how uh, you know he um, is always very clear about the fact that uh, his past defines and shapes his present there is no denying the fact of course um, we also learned how the present also uh, redefines the past but uh, there there was no denying at any point in his life in his poetic uh, career that he is what he is because of his upbringing because of his tradition because of his religion because of his family because of the childhood that he spent in india in spite of all the exposure that he later had in spite of all the experiences that he had in various lands he remained himself or he remained what he was because of the way that he had been brought up and that is what is again highlighted in this um, poem where he says you know i cannot claim for myself anything that is uniquely my own contribution i cannot but i i can only underline the fact that i am what i am because of the way because of what i belong to because of the uh, you know the background that i belong to and so the father there uh, symbolizes all that he is um, you know his tradition his religion his upbringing his uh, his past his um, you know the customs and the tradition in which he is brought up so um, you know uh, we also saw how uh, you know at um, in every poem of his even when he um, uh, you know lived abroad and he he always um, made it a point to write only about that which he knew quite well his indian background um, memory plays a very Um, significant uh, uh, role in all of his poems they are all built on earlier childhood memories he never strays from them at the same time at no point does he become overly um, emotional about them never does he get to romantic or sentimental about them 
to the extent of saying that you know he is very nostalgic about these and that he misses them never you know he that kind of emotional uh, tone is not there in any of his poems and in a similar manner here also you know, it's in a very objective manner that he talks about the way i am what i am because of the way that i have been brought up by my family by my parents you know the family and the tradition here represented by the parents you know it it's not something that he is overly proud about it's not something that he glorifies it's not something that he gets um, sentimental about but he makes it a clear statement there is no ambiguity regarding that it is as clear as day like that he is what he is because of the way he has been brought up so that is how this self portrait becomes a unique self portrait it's unlike any other self portrait and that is what makes it a post colonial poem when he writes a poem about a self portrait he does not write it in a way the colonial um you know ethos would have expected him to write about it colonially you would have had to write about a self portrait with all the distinctive features of a self portrait a person who looks like him and, and a person who uh, paints his um, uh, or signs the painting himself and and so on these are the conventional um, features of a self portrait but he uh, frees himself of that kind of conventional meaning he frees himself of that colonial european or western um sense of the term self portrait and dares to present a self portrait which is different this is how i see my self portrait and i will tr remain true to it uh, you know it, it, there is no um uh, doubt in him that this is what 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 he wants to write about you know it's so therefore in uh, remaining true to himself remaining true to what he is and not stooping to the level of a colonial demand he writes freely in a very candid manner about his own self portrait he claims that there is nothing unique about the self portrait in this portrait he looks like everyone else because that is how he has been trained to understand his own self his own being always in relation to with someone else he was probably brought up in a large um joint family you know that is how that is the Im image that we get when we read a poem uh, of ramanujan like um small scale reflections on a large house or he you know you have these uh, reflections expressed on his ancestral house the house could be his own house it could be his family it could be the joint family that he belonged to it could be the tradition that he belonged to it could be the religion that he belonged to it could be the civilization the hindu civilization or the indian civilization that he belonged to and there is no denying the fact that that is what he is a part of however further he would have traveled away from it however farther he would have tra traveled away from it he is what he is and that is something that cannot be erased so he remains true to that self and um, you can find a very bold and a very candid and a very frank attempt on the part of a writer who in spite of all his exposure in spite of all his experiences remains true to what he has been trained to believe regarding himself i am neti neti i am i am uh, you know you you do not have that um uh, uh, i think therefore i am kind of concept here that kind of humanistic thinking which places the individual at the center you know uh, and um, lionizes the individual you do not have that kind of that concept of individualism the individualism the individual is here after all part of the larger cosmic universal self so that is how it becomes a very a significant small as it is this is a poem which tells us a very important um feature some of the important features of post colonial writing the way in which it remains true to itself and it redefines itself uh, free of western or european 
influences okay so that is the poem self portrait you can also uh, you know if you do not want to look at it that way you can look at it as a poet um, you know as a very existential poem where the speaker is probably uh, concerned about um, the laws of identity living in a world where um, you know meaninglessness stares at him from all quarters a person who has lost his bearing a person who feels a keen loss of identity that is also there you know but uh, when you're looking at the poem as a post colonial poem i would uh, rather say that it is the other reading you know the um, that 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 does more justice to the poem okay i hope you have understood the poem and uh, and that you will be able to write on this about this poem yourself okay please do read it read up more on ekera manujan read up a few more of his poems and uh, you know get a sense of that uh, post colonial element in ramanujan's poetry okay